Hello, everybody. Welcome to our channel, Scientology Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm here with my co-host, uh, Janice Gillum Grady. How you doing, Janice? Aloha, Mark, and good day, everybody. I'm, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm enjoying this great weather that we have. And yeah. my swimming pool is open, and I've been swimming every day for the last week. So That's it's fantastic. good. I, would, I just wanted to mention to our viewers, we really appreciate you guys viewing and that we've done a lot of great interviews here recently but again please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and also uh, make sure uh, we have a guest here this isn't live but you know hit hit us up with questions and comments afterwards it really helps the channel out when you do that so i just wanted to mention that go ahead okay Jim. good okay today's guest is one that i've wanted to interview for a long time he's a very good friend i've known him since i was 12 years old when we we on the Apollo, we sailed into Algeria on our way to going to uh, Greece, where we ended up staying for nine months. But anyway, he came aboard as he learned, he met us as a translator, and he knew nothing about Scientology. And he trained all the way up to Class A, and he became a very good friend of mine. And we've stayed in touch over the years, and I recently visited with him over in Morocco. Anyway, so let's welcome Balkasim Faraj. Thank you. Hi, Bill. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Janice. Hi, Mark. <laughs> yeah, how are you doing? Just uh, just let everybody know where you're at. You're actually in, in Morocco right now, right? I have lived now in the city of Agadir since March of 2020 and it is we are eight hours apart we're ahead so it's about 10 uh, 10 10 p.m 10 12 p.m here and um i saw uh, in october of last year i saw janice with a group of uh, friends that i know and that friends that i've met for the first time and we spent a wonderful day together <laughs> Uh, yeah, we did. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, that was that was our group. Not everyone in that photo uh, knew Bell, but this photo here. This is the group of us. Two, there was uh, five of us that knew Bell from before. Uh, uh, six, six of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, Bob's Bob's missing from that photo. Bob Visk. Right. Go ahead. But, uh, yes, yeah. Right. It was, yeah, so on the left is Spanky Taylor, who we've interviewed, and then Balkasin is next to uh, her, and then next to him in the white shirt is Stu Moreau, who we're in the middle of doing interviews with, and then to Stu, well, to the right is Lynn Visk, and then myself and Louise Schechter, and all of us were on the Apollo except for Spanky, and we all knew Belle from our days on the ship. Yep. And when we sailed in and... Balkasim met us at the dock with a friend of his who had a tour company. So he met us with a bus and prearranged tours and took us all over Agadir. And Agadir is actually one of my favorite towns in Morocco. I really loved Agadir and Tangier the most, those two. So it was great having him there and him giving us the tour. And we went back to Hotel Modern, which was a hotel that I stayed in uh, for for a month when the ship sailed off to Spain, myself and the other messengers and LRH's aides, we all lived in Agadir for a month. And um, so Belle took me back to that hotel, <laughs> which it, it's uh, definitely seen its years. <laughs> and, it, and it was funny when we went in there, I, I brought up to the guy with, with Balkasim translating, I brought up the how I used to, I lived there and I remembered Habib who used to live under the staircase and that guy knew Habib, and, yeah. and, but he, uh, he passed away recently. So here I was like 54 years later and- This guy is not even born. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> he, that was all that. <laughs> yeah, he's this, he's this foreigner woman who comes in and shows him his plate, tells him this is here, this is here. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, anyway, it, it was fun doing that. Uh, yeah, so, it was. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, you should have been here. <laughs> Bill? Yes, my dear. Oh, okay. I thought you said something. I, I know. I said the market should have been here because it was hilarious. The man <laughs> trying to keep up with you, he did not know what hit him. This woman, <laughs> foreigner, doesn't speak any French or any Arabic, and she's showing him his own hotel, a place that he'd never seen before. <laughs> 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 yeah, because I, I was probably I was probably uh, fourteen at the time when we'd stayed at that hotel. Anyway, so that that was a fun memory. Yeah. So anyway, so Bell, so yes. Bell, how we want to start at the beginning as we usually do. How did you get involved with Scientology and the Apollo in? Was, uh, wherever it was at, was it Morocco or you know? Could you just tell the story for our viewers uh, yeah. who are watching? Yeah, I. <clears throat> you have to know something. I didn't know anything about Scientology or the Sea Org or anything. I was working as a ship's rep in Algiers, in the city of Algiers, and a ship's rep, so that you understand, is like the representative of the ship that arrives to the port, which was Algiers, for the authorities in that city. So I was assigned by my company with whom the Royal Scotland of those days had contracted to uh, uh, help them out more and find a place for two more and to buy uh, what they call ship channeling, meaning all the provisions that they need <coughs> and uh, offshore communications, and if there's anybody sick, how to take them to the hospital and that. That was my job to arrange. So I was assigned by my company to welcome the Royal Scotland in those days to, this, to the port of Algiers, and I arranged for its birth, uh, and its mooring. I arranged for the pilot to bring him in, I arranged for the ship channeler to bring them provisions. I arranged for the communications to be established offshore with the ship. So if they need to send any uh, anything special, deliveries, whatever, the whole thing. You know, in other words, you know, when you go overseas, you have to have a hotel, you have to have money, you have to go through immigration, and the point is that's what the ship's rub does, and. What it was is that my counterpart, I am the offshore rep, right, in the city of Algiers, but the ship itself has their own rep that deals with the people offshore. And the ship's rep's name was Dick Laddie. <laughs> and he and I don't know how, by just God's um, grace, I guess, we just, we just chemi chem chemistry wise really plugged in and uh, we became very close friends. And uh, he introduced me to uh, a person, I forgot the name, but, but, but there was an American young man with jet black hair whose face was completely messed up with, um, you know, eczema. But he was John, John Bragan. Huh? John John Bragan. I don't remember him. Okay. His face was always greasy anyway. His hair was always greasy. And he brought a lot of telexes to send at our office offshore. And I remember why I remember this guy. It's very simple. Because I asked him a question. I said, they tell me something. First of all, why do you always come when we are about to close at 6.37 p.m.? <laughs> and number two, why is every one of your messages ends with ARC? He said, ARC. I said, yeah, the letter ARC. No, he says, that's A-R-C. I said, A-R-C. 
<laughs> it was an arc, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know <laughs> where, where was that? We, we need to explain that. Let me just explain A ARC to our viewers means affinity reality communication. And in Scientology, instead of signing a letter, love Janice, I would say ARC Janice. So it'd be my right. affinity reality communication. Right. But I mean, that's my first contact with Scientology. Bell, Bell, do you, what year was this, and 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 where? What port was this in? The port was Algiers. The year was 1968, and the ship sailed into Algiers uh, at the end of, um, uh, not the end, around the third week of June. Sailed in, and they needed a lot of provisions, sent a lot of text messages, uh, you know, at the end of closing, I told you. And there was a lot of staff, very important staff that was coming in from overseas to join the ship in Algiers. And as the ship's rep, I was the one that had to go to the airport and clear them that they were indeed coming to the ship because I was an authorized uh, state um, uh, authority, if you want to, 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 to declare on oath that these guys are taking them directly to the ship, and this is why I am, my credentials, blah, blah, blah. And guess who came in? Who? Mary Sue Hubbard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, because usually the, sh the representative from the port doesn't usually go to the airport. Our own people do that. But because it was Mary Sue, Bell got to do that. Now, how old were you at this time? Uh, I was 20 and about seven months old, 20 okay. years old. And then now, also, you... right after her came Bill Howie. Now, but let me ask you though, when you start, first saw Mary Sue Hubbard, which, did she have flaming red hair and everything? I mean, do you remember was, that? She was, she was very, very, because Dick Laddie, who came with me, he could not get into uh, beyond the uh, security and the police, yeah. but I go through and wait right at the arrival of the gate so I could take her right through and not have to go through the line and all that stuff, you know? So I escorted her right at the gate upon arrival when they arrived at the gate and I took her right through and Dick Laddie was there, and he obviously, and she obviously knew Dick Laddie. And we came in my car those days, it was a company car, it was a Renault station wagon. And we went, and guess who was waiting on the ass deck? Had to be L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> my very first contact with that man. Very first time ever that I met that man. And guess who was by his side? Diana. You. You. I was oh, just I saying, was. I bet you it was Janice. Yeah. <laughs> you. Will. Okay. She would have been about 12 years old or something. <laughs> and so was Nancy Tidman. Do you remember Nancy Tidman? Yeah. 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 The blondie yeah. with daddy long legs. She yep. was so and short blonde hair and by uh, you were on um, if I remember very well you were on the his left side and right next to him on the right hand side was Diana and um, little uh, Arthur Arthur, yes. Arthur. <laughs> and there's Popham and his wife Janet and Janet Guilford right Joyce. Oh, Janet, yeah. Janet Joyce. Guilford. Yep. Guilford. We're all, you know, on the first above the galley, all, you know, looking over and like Mary Sue coming on board. You know, it was a scene. And I remember one thing, those eyes of that man. He looked at me, who was wearing all white. And he had a scarf also around. Yeah, his cravat, the cravat, yes. And he looked at me in his 
eyes were just like right into me. I felt like two rays of sun coming right through me. And he tapped me on the shoulder, I remember. You're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and Dick said to him, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's our excellent ship trip. Yeah, I heard all about him. <laughs> and she said, Mary said, yes, he was very quick with us. He was, everything was perfect. Was, so, I mean, I was halfway standing, halfway floating, and I don't know what it was. But that was my very first contact with that man. So that's how I met Ron Hubbard, first time ever, and the occasion. Now, you ask me, how did I ever come in contact with Scientology? I'll tell you. No, nothing about Scientology. But during the, all of this time, the ship was needing all kinds of things. And I was practically on the ship every single day, interfacing with Dick Laddie and this with young men that would come at the end of the day with these messages to send by text, uh, telex. It's it's still those, calm. <laughs> Text going to Saint Hill. Everything was going to Saint Hill, Saint Hill, or A or whatever it was. And we don't know nothing about these codes. <laughs> Anyhow, I looking at the ship and there's these people. Some were nice. Some were wearing like gray overalls, all dirty. Some had things wrapped around their hands here, like a chain. No, it was like a, by the liability. Oh, the gray rag. The gray rag. <laughs> Some very well dressed. Some like officers, a lot of beautiful women. A lot of women officers. Never seen that in my life. Nobody in Algeria or in Algiers received the ship of that sort ever. And everyone was trying to like, please, what's that ship? Tell us, what's that ship? What it's all about? I said, I don't know. It's a school ship. That's all I could say. It's a school ship. And Dick sensed and felt that I wanted to be on that ship. And he said, would you like to come with us when we leave? I said, my God, yes. <laughs> of course I would. <laughs> now, you have to remember something or maybe know something which is unknown, is that Algeria at that time was a socialist, pro-Soviet Union aligned state. And so as in every socialist, pro-Soviet Union state, it had an apparatus of, uh, of security which was very elaborate. So on each and every single ship, Right by the gangplank, as you go up, there is a policeman and a customs officer with a register, and they register every single one that comes in or goes off, at what time, and, and their name. And it was 24 hours a day, three shifts of eight hours. And so now, when I wanted to come, <laughs> to the ship, <laughs> how am I going to come on board the ship with those people and not go out? The register will show it. So Dick Laddie said, ah, don't worry. Our ship has got side doors. <laughs> and I told him, oh, okay, what we'll do is, that, you know, when they change the guard at midnight and it's dark, I'll be ready. You open the side door, right in. And now the ship, though, was in the center, right by the entrance of the harbor. And that door closes 8 p.m. at night. Nobody goes in, nobody goes out. That's it. But you can come from way far out, about three and a half miles away, from the harbor area where the load liquid, such as the tankers of, of petroleum, gas, methane, whatever. And I came through that one 
and the guys at the of course at the entrance because it's no open it's open entrance it's not uh, like a gated or anything like that there's no cargo no nothing just one or two ships and that's it the guys were playing dominoes i remember it and dick had told me don't bring much clothes just bring a small little thing suitcase and that's it you cannot i said fine and i brought a very tight little suitcase and I entered by that, and those guys playing them, and they said, oh, where are you going? Because they know me from everywhere I go on that harbor. I said, we have a, um, uh, I knew that there was a German tanker, and I said, we have a sick guy who was at the hospital today, and I bring him his clothes because the ship's leaving tomorrow. It's not my ship, but I, I have to bring them that clothes. He said, okay, go ahead. And what I did is the moment I came in, I went in. I, you have to look at Imagine you, you you enter this way and you have to look to the left. The left is like about two miles away, right on the alongside the docks. All the ships are moored, but you can't see anything. So I'm coming back from that entrance along the docks with my little suitcase all the way till I arrive and timing it so I arrive by like about quarter to twelve or so and I arrive. That 15 minutes felt like it was 55 million years. <laughs> and sure enough, there is a van that comes with the replacement of the police officer and the customs officers midnight. And they go up the gangplanks, you know, hi, hi, hi. And that time the door opened. And I the cattle took, door. Yeah, and I took a beeline like you could <laughs> never, never. <laughs> in my life but i was only like about 35 yards away hidden behind there's like a a mound of um, uh, gravel that they were doing something with on the dock <gasps> and i dove inside and he closed the door and hey this is <laughs> That's a that's how you get stowaways. <laughs> that's a stowaway, dude. And there's all these guys waiting to look at me coming in, you know, like somebody told them that I was coming in, obviously Dick. There was all these people. And I will never remember the very first one who was standing by the door side of the of that cattle door. Do you remember Emeritas? Yes. Yes. Long, tall Imara with the, with the braided long hair, blonde hair. Remember her? Yes. Yes. She actually became Imara Shore and was, she owned the Shore Medical Center that the Scientologists used. She was the first one that pulled me in and closed the door and gave me a hug. She never wore makeup, if you remember. And she was tall, always with um, uh, uh, tennis shoes. Never wore shoes, just tennis shoes. And always with blue overalls. Very, very unusual, but very intelligent girl. I remember mean, she was yeah. very with me. That's how I came on board, Mark, to answer your question. Okay, okay. Well, here, here this is a picture of this is about what you looked at about that time, right? I know this might be later on, but you're that's it was, it was a year later, yeah. Yeah. This, this you're about this, 21 years old there. This picture was about 20 and a half old. No. I was, this was uh, after the class eight course. The, uh, actually what you see there is my class A certificate behind me. Uh, and during this time, I was the case supervisor on board. So wow. we need to backtrack a little bit. Yeah, because- yeah, I just wanted to show, I just wanted to show the photo of what he looked like back then. So, so yeah. what did you do? Did you immediately go into training in Scientology no. or? Is that <laughs> my, my very first encounter <laughs> when I went on board they said that was good and great but I was taken straight to the MAA <laughs> Joran Robertson <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and, and Robinson told me oh Welcome on top of the ship, you know, with his mustache and his hat. Yeah, his mustache, yeah. And and he carried a baton. Yeah. And he's always like cynical. Who are you talking about? Joran Robertson. The, the he was a Swedish MAA, the ethics oh, okay. officer. I was thinking of Joan Robertson. <laughs> no, Joran. Yeah, okay. He was no relation. He asked me 
sign a document in order to be admitted on the ship and to be part of the crew. And I said, what's this document? And he said, hey, read it here. And uh, it was the CO contract. <laughs> and the thing that hit me <laughs> was billion years, billion, billion years. Was like, uh, what is it talking billion years? <laughs> There's billion years here, billion, billion, billion. He says, just sign it. <laughs> Well, just stay on the ship. <laughs> and you did. I said, I'll sign it. <laughs> Little did you know what you were signing up for. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, I said, this is crazy. I knew this guy was crazy. Who is a billionaire? <laughs> I said, okay. If that's what keeps me on the ship, I'll sign anything. <laughs> Now, did you work in the port captain's office at that time? And after, after, no, after after I signed the document, they took me to hold number two. Oh. They okay. were going on still past midnight. And there were classes still going on. And there is, they told me to just sit there and stay there a little while. And I don't forget. This was the eve of the departure of the ship. And the rule is the ship strap that entered the ship into the harbor is the one that will arrange for its departure. That means we'll make, we'll inform the, the uh, police authorities, the customs authorities, arrange for the pilot to pull him out, to bring the tugboats and the whole thing. And Mr. Bell was not there <laughs> next morning. Where, where no, you're he? you're and, stowing away. <laughs> and I never miss work. But this, this, <clears throat> the reason why I'm mentioning it, because it caught up with me in 1970. And I would okay. later on how, how that caught up with me. Okay. I was in there, and I was told um, by um, uh, the MAA and by Dick and by some other people, and oh, Joe Van Staden, that to please kind of like stay away from sight because we were leaving the next day, and they did not know if anybody was going to be making up and maybe final rounds or anything like that. So they hid me behind where there is all of these stacks of uh, um, the, the life vests. All the life vests? That were spare, that were spare right by the, uh, the supercargo area. And I was hidden there until actually I could hear that the guys, you know, m moving the the ropes and all that stuff and the, the ship sailed then they told me it was like about 10 30 10 35 in the morning the next day i didn't sleep i didn't close one eye and then they took me up to the poop deck and in the poop deck the whole crew was there and i was brought like here's the here's here's our package Everybody is laughing. <laughs> oh my God. I will never forget that sight. And I was assigned right that day to work with Dick Laddie in Division 7 as the ship's rep and translator on board to be the assistant to Dick Laddie. That was it. So now where are we sailing? Ah, standing to be there to Nizam. Yep. And who is in Bizer Tunisia? My sister. Oh no. Yes, and I was afraid that maybe somebody from Algiers, the authorities would say, Hey, there's somebody missing, they might be on the ship when arrived to Tunis, you know, they're close countries, close friends, they could look and all that stuff. So 
I was told, and I'm going to tell the story to Dick. He said, hey, you don't go to see your sister. You don't do anything. You stay on board. And they put me way up in the front with that little teacher, Swedish Anderson, you know, in that little nursery. Yeah, where the daycare, where the nursery was yeah. in the forecastle. Yeah. We stayed for maybe like about six or seven hours. That's it. And then we sailed. And we sailed straight to Corfu. <sighs> so what, and you what were your jobs on the ship what were your jobs on the ship at that time like you just you were in the port captain oh. office working with dick laddie and and all that well my my schedule was that i worked with the with the with dick laddie when he was on duty and then at the end of the day after after dinner is go study so we go down to the holds and I'll see all these people looking at each other and the burst flight, the burst flight, the burst flight. Do birds fly? <laughs> they're running the ruse, they're being bull baited, and I'm not understanding any of this stuff. But I found it fascinating. So I was introduced to James Byrne. Oh. Who was at the time in charge of supervising the classes in there? Who gave me Dianetics, the modern science of mental health? And he said, This is the very first book you're going to read, and you have to be you have to pass the test on it. That's how I started my twin. And my twin, yeah, I don't know who my first twin was. Oh, no, I was the. the there was nobody that was doing that. I was just sitting next to people who were doing all these things. And it was more fascinating by them than what I was reading. Then I started to read that. And then from that point on, I got into loving studying. And then... I was going to say, were you a good student? Like, did you take to it pretty quickly? I was like a sponge that was dry and you just dropped it into a bucket of glue and <laughs> it all up. I was so fascinated because it told me that, hey, this is the science of knowing how to know Scientology. The science of knowing how to know. Wow, I'm gonna learn to know how to know I was fascinated and I took everything and I took all the courses and I started with all the small courses and the same, you know, the clearing course and the comp courses and the TRs and the roots and then the, the, the class one course and the two and the three and the four and the five and the, the class six course and the SHSBC and then I was being audited at the same time and I was really becoming part of this and my twin was assigned throughout all these courses all over again was quentin quentin hubbard yes and we went he and i we went all the way through to the class eight as twins we graduated wow. together well i was going to say were you full-time student i mean that's that's a lot of study you had to do all of that it took me off post i was a top top student and i was just nothing but a student and I was with him doing nothing else but that, and also learning how to audit, becoming an auditor. And I started to audit, and I started to audit, and take courses, audit, and take courses, and that's all that I was doing. <clears throat> and my job was an auditor at the same time. It's not I was doing I nothing. See. Yeah. And uh, that's how it was. Yeah. Yeah. So tell, tell everybody what this <laughs> this had to be early on, right? Yeah, this was it, early on. Birthday, this was a birthday party for Ron Pook, I believe. For, what, somebody. for Ron Pook? I don't know. I, I think don't... It down for I... Pook. Something was there about, uh, about them, no? Yeah, I don't remember what it was, but but in that picture, that's, um. I'll go from the left, bottom bottom corner left behind the pole. Yeah. That's Bel that's Belkacy. <laughs> Hey, I'm in, in the white shirt, in the white shirt, right? In the, in the white shirt, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's Bell, and then if you go to the people who are standing up and saluting in the front row, 
On the left is Annie Tidman, Annie Broker. And then in the middle is Sharon Stainforth. And then on the right, that's me. Yeah. And then behind me in the dark sweater and the hat, that's Norman Starkey. Yep. Next to him the to black, the left. The black hat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And next to him in the back with the beard is Dave Murphy. Right. And then next to Dave on the left is uh, Nikki Friedman, Nikki Merwin. And she heard this. There's um, decorations cutting off her face. And then um, on the very left is um, Dan, uh, Alan and Virginia Capula's daughter. Um, I don't remember. Deanna. Deanna. What was that, Bill? Deanna Reeves. No? No, no. Deanna Ross. Deanna Ross. Or, because, yeah. Yeah. I remember Deanna. I remember her. Yeah. She, she, was related, she, was she lives in... Peach, no? Pardon? She was related to Peach's book, no? Yes, yes. yes. Peach's yes. sister. Yeah. Peach's younger sister, yes. She was from the Athena and she came over. Yes, yeah. yeah. And her parents owned the uh, Reno Scientology mission. Yeah, she's still in touch with me, you know? Yeah, I'm in touch with her. Uh, yeah, she's up in Reno still. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what were y'all doing yeah. there, Janice? Were you singing to L. Ron Hubbard for his birthday or what, with the salutes well, and everything or what? Yeah, we were singing to him. I'm not sure what it was for. It was a birth um, birthday. And I don't know whose birthday it was. I don't think it was. I don't. Yeah, you were there. So that means it was him. Yeah. If you, if you two soldiers, bodyguards were there, that means it was him. <laughs> well, the three the three people in the front, all of us were messengers, myself, yeah. Sharon, and Annie. Yeah. So Yeah, uh, you and this. Yeah, so <laughs> maybe it was, well, I don't even know if you were a class eight by this time or oh, no. if it was, you weren't. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Almost, yeah. almost. So, so this would have been between July and December of 1968. I was in some sort, of course, I, I am 100% sure because as you can see, I have civilian clothes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let me ask you, Belle, what was it like? Uh, do you remember your interactions with Janice at that time when she was just a young girl? Uh, actually, we didn't have much interaction except for uh, greetings because um, I didn't have anything to do uh, with any anything with the people that she uh, was in, like the ship, like the ship things or um, management or that type of thing, right? Janice. Was, Janice at the time was the running arrow, going up and down, <laughs> running, and always with something. Or, or she was standing in front of the person that she needed to, to say something to, and she would deliver it. Uh, you know, in a military style, and turn around, and gone. You know, that's it. <laughs> and I didn't have much interaction with her, but I really began to have some with her, but politely from far distance. When I started to be <clears throat> an auditor in the class eight course, during part of the class eight course, uh, uh, when you're taking the course, you have to audit a lot of people on the processes that you learn in the class eight course. And you take the folders to LRH and she was always standing by the door of the entrance, like a bodyguard to the office. <laughs> Do you she remember had, this Janice? She had the yeah. knife, which was wide. <laughs> she would sit sometime on it. There will be, you could sit three of Janice on the chair that she had. <laughs> <laughs> And she sat there and, you know, she was always polite and courteous. And those were the very first few times that I began to interact with him. Just when I take the folders, he would CS them for me. He would make whatever comments we would make and then give me the next set of instructions. And woof, I was gone. I got to interact with Janice later on. <laughs> Not in the same circumstances. Okay. <laughs> we'll get to that part. Now, hey, what, what about... <laughs> now you you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned when you first met Hubbard uh, and Mary Sue when on the ship 
do you remember early interactions with L. Ron Hubbard, like when you were a student or since you were training with Quentin or anything like that, that Quentin was Hubbard's son? No. I started to become a person of interest to him only <clears throat> during the class eight course. And prior to the class eight course on some of the other things that we do on power processing. The case supervisor, the CS was Otto Roos. And he had assigned me some uh, uh, PCs to run some um, RVRs uh, on, on them as part of the uh, processes. And they were so, 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 so happy. He made a special note that this guy is always getting very well done, very well done. So I got called for the very first time. And that's why. Uh, who, who put me in the class eight course was Edwin Hubbard, not not anybody else. He called me in and he said, uh, you know, very good reports, you know, the way he talks. <laughs> you know, a lot of things. Uh, I think you ought to be doing class eight course. All right. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> what, am I, what am I to say? That was it. And then the class eight course, Top best auditors were put in, and the others had to be. Some had to be retrained and to join again, and then started to come at the same time. All of these VIPs from overseas, and that's how I met Mama. Rest in peace. <laughs> yeah. Now, hey, I was going to ask you when you're on the class eight. She came at the same time as Alan Walters, same day. Right. John McMasters had come earlier by two or three days and then started to come all of these VIPs from all over the place. Are you talking, you didn't mention her name, Janice. So, so you're talking about Janice's mother, Yvonne? Yes. Yes. Yvonne. Yeah, they were on the class eight course together. Okay. She, she, yeah. It's a pity you have not met. Have you met her, Mark? I met I met her at, at towards the end of her life. Yes, just once. There is one thing about her that one never forgets. That's that constant smile on her face. She has, oh yeah, she has a constant smile. The warmth is what I remember. You know what I mean? Oh. Like you didn't even have to. You you just felt. You know you know what I mean by warmth? Like yes. just her presence when you were in yes. the same room is just like yes. wow. You know. Beautiful set of lips that were full and warm cheeks, <laughs> short hair. Very nice, very nice person. You felt at ease around her. She always was a soothing person. No matter what the problem was, she was always a soothing person, a soothing uh, individual. You know what I mean? I mean, she was. I think she was created to soothe people. Right. And uh, we were all this, and we all had to wear the same thing green overalls <laughs> no more no more civilian clothes that's right and it was a fantastic all of the whole number two was all transformed into a fantastic yeah let me just explain Go ahead, hold yeah. num hold number two on the ship was the classroom that was the hubbard guidance center hgc yeah, and that's that's where everyone went for study, whether you were studying your able-bodied check sheet to be a seaman, or if you were studying Scientology or your staff statuses, everybody was down in that hold for yep. study. And every yeah. equipped with everything imaginable that you can find in a um, university in the United States, I mean, equipment that anything you want to, it was there. You could do anything you want to there. Who who was the supervisor of the Class A course? Was Hubbard supervising, or, or no. was he just was he just overseeing the case supervision? No, 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 no. In the early days, you know, there was people. Among them was was still, believe it or not. Um, uh, uh, James Byrne, but those days was only the beginning of the class eight course was nothing but lectures at first. So 
James Byrne and a couple of others, I don't remember who they were. They were just to walk by to make sure that you did. If you nodded off, that means you passed misunderstood. They wake you up and they make you go, hey, go back, you know? Right. Uh, and uh, uh, then there was uh, immediately the class A course was doing nothing but auditing on each other. So it's not something like courses where there's lectures and you sit there and he's there and it gives you like the SSBC or the others. No, or, or the clinical. No, no, no. It was not like that. It was auditing. The, the orders would come from the messengers. It would be brought and the folders would be brought and the call people would bring them down. Rat Totten would bring them down. Um... Uh, Deitch, Bill Deitch will bring them down. Um, the, Bill Howie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Irene Dan Levy, we, we, used to, we used to also sometimes bring them down. And we just had sets and they will be given. Okay, you you go audit so-and-so. You go audit so-and-so. You go, so it was, that's all that it was. Where was the auditing? Did they have auditing rooms or was oh, it in the course room? Where? Everywhere. And plenty. Cabins. Plenty. People's cap. People's cabins were oh, okay. Plenty. used for auditing. And 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 it was wonderful because you take, you know, the auditor, the the the, the, the PC, there were not PCs, some of them were <laughs> some of them were OTs. <laughs> you audit, you do your report, you take I mean you audit, you take the person to the examiner, you do your report, and then you get to take it. And you get to be graded by that the interaction, daily interaction with LRH on that. But did now, go ahead, Janice. Go ahead. Bell, my mother, if she didn't get a well done or a or a very well done session, I remember her having to all the any of the class eights go being thrown overboard. So I remember her being thrown overboard once for a session that wasn't well done. Yeah. Did you ever get thrown overboard? Yes, once. Yeah, <laughs> once. John, I got once too. <laughs> and John McMasters, the poor guy, also. John McMasters to be thrown overboard was really a heartbreak. You know, he didn't land very na nicely, and he was very hurt. It was humiliating to him. But I was not thrown overboard because of the class eight. Oh, why did you go over? I was in insubordination and, and ordered by, uh, what's his name, by Duran Robinson. For insubordination. Yeah, what were you insubordinate about? I don't know. I may have told him to go take a hike. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember, to be honest. Let with me you. ask you. But I, yeah. Bell, uh, Bell uh, what about, did, did I don't know. I know, like you mentioned on the briefing course, Hubbard gave lectures and things like that. Did he ever give lectures? I know there were class eight tapes. Where, hmm. Did he ever give lectures? And like, did you guys sit in on yeah. he was giving I, lectures? He, yeah. he used to get them all done during the, the time that uh, in his office. And he was staying up so late. I don't know if yeah. you remember, but he was doing all of his lectures from the Arctic and he would give specific cases that we did that day. That's right. But what happened, he, we would set up the B deck dining room, which was the officer's yeah. dining room. Yeah. Everything be moved aside and that was all set up and tables set up with recording equipment. Bill Howie did the recordings yeah. and LRH would go down there and all the eights are sitting there waiting for him. And as the messenger, I had to make sure that there was no noises around the ship that would interfere with the lecture. Yeah. And I got I got you some payback to Duran Robertson because I remember Duran and um, Bob James started wrestling on the A the A dip deck to B deck stairs, and I quickly ran over there and had to tell them to be quiet and to knock it off. They would like play wrestling while the le class eight lecture was going on, and then after the lecture was over, Hubbard says to me, "What was that noise?" that was coming from the stairs. And I said, oh, that was Duran and Bob. And he said, throw them overboard. <laughs> so they both I remember that. I remember that. I was so happy. I remember that. Yes. I remember that because it was payback. Yeah. yeah. I, 
<clears throat> Let me ask you, Val, what, what was it like sitting in a, a le live lecture with L. Ron Hubbard? What was that like? Huh? What was it like for people who have never experienced it? What was it like sitting in a live lecture with L. Ron Hubbard when he's giving a lecture like on the Class 8 course? What, what's it like? Okay, le let me tell you. Um, first of all, he did not come down to give a Class 8 course to us. He, lay, he gave the, the lecture in front of his staff it was uh, even though it was addressed to us mm -hmm. was relayed to us he would come once in a while maybe to talk, to talk to a group of us from his deck he would never come down he would maybe say something like that he used to call people over to him but let me tell you what it was like to be one-on-one -on -one with him while he is csing your folder <laughs> <laughs> go ahead you know, I don't, that man, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody says, really, honestly, from the bottom of my heart. That man had the power to absorb written material like if it was, he had 100 eyes. He could read pages of notes taken during the session very quickly and find out what's going on you know that's if the auditor was good if there's no notes then the auditor would be in trouble if there are very little notes the auditor was in trouble especially if the session was an hour and 15 minutes and there's like one page and a half <laughs> forget it but i remember what it was like to say hey, see this look at this this is the same question asked of this PC to this PC. To the answer is this one should be this one, and this one didn't give it. What gates? <laughs> he would get very, very alive, you know. And when he gave you a, a lecture about anything, that person has enigma in his face and like also has, what do you call those things uh, that, that attract uh, steel and it sticks to like it? Like a magnet, magnet. It was magnetic in his face and his look. You looked at him when he looked at you. You looked at him or you were, you know, uh, fidgeted, stop like that, you couldn't, very strong, powerful person. His delivery, I had lectures from him about not the class eight course only. I had lectures from him about his past. And I don't, I don't know how to explain it to you, but you can be standing there 48 minutes, 50 minutes. It was as if it was two minutes. Hold on, you said lectures about his what? What, we, what did you say? Past. His own past, his own past life. Oh, his past. Okay, his past. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you stand there, <laughs> sci-fi movie. <laughs> I want to explain something to our viewers because a lot of our viewers have never been in Scientology. Oh, really? when, when somebody is, is auditing a, a somebody, a counseling somebody, they keep detailed worksheets of what, what questions are asked and the meter reads, you know, what reads were on the meter and also what the what the person they're counseling, what they say and, and that type of thing. And it's all kept in a folder, all right? So that way a case supervisor can review it afterwards. And that's what uh, Bell is talking about is Hubbard would go through the folders and he'd be able to quickly ascertain what was going on in the session. And of course, you know, he's relying on the, the person doing the auditing to truthfully write down what is going on. You know what I mean? Because if, you know, the auditor is falsifying things, then, it, then it, you know, he's not getting accurate information. But anyway, that's what he was talking about when he was talking about all the pages. Sorry, but it's my dog. Go ahead. I am very proud to say that in my entire auditing life, whether he was a supervisor or auto rules for the supervisor, or Roderick Totten was a supervisor, 
um, I have never had anything less than a well done. It was either well done or very well done, continue. Yeah, and these, those are grades that the case supervisor would give. Yeah. Well done, very well done, or what was that, a flunk? Or I, I don't forget. Flunk, a flunk, you go, you flunk, you go overboard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. Okay, either. It's either well done, flunk, or very well done, continue, uh, because continue, because you make recommendations as to what you think should be the next step. Right. And then he tells you either yes or no. Yeah. If you get it very well done, continue. Oh, nice. And, yeah. and if you make a mistake, then you might get what's called a cramming order or a correction order where you would go and restudy whatever it is that you maybe made a mistake on that the case supervisor found. But then you would just go ahead, do that, and then go take the person back into session and continue. Right. And, I, and us, usually it was written. Huh? Usually it was written, it would either say well done or WD or VWD. Very yeah. well done. He, for me, he never, I never had the initials. He, <laughs> you know, you know, how, he's wide, he's a V. It was very well done, continue, or very well done. And um, I'm very proud of the fact that he entrusted himself to me, his wife, his daughter, his, and two of his sons for me to audit during the right. time I was involved with it. Right, yeah, let me make that clear. Balkasim was one of the few auditors that audited Hubbard. Uh, there was Balkasim, David Mayo, Jeff Walker, Mike Maurer. Um, Otto Roos. Otto Roos. And, um, oh, there was uh, Lucy Monzilla. Lucy... Anyway, Lucy was like 1968, and then she went to the Advanced Org AOLA in Los I Angeles. Was sick in Morocco in Casablanca during the dry dock. He during was. The, he was sick, if you remember, in Casablanca during the dry dock. The, yes. And that was the time that uh, uh, he asked that I go take a look what's going on you know that was it right right yep so there weren't a lot of people that audited him but balkasim was one of them let me ask you about that then balkasim that that's actually pretty amazing i mean this was the man who you know basically was training you and you know had developed you know his technology or whatever was it intimidating taking him into session for the first time don't bother <laughs> miss my dog <laughs> inside, inside, intimidating, but outside, very proud. I was very proud to be in front of him. Very proud, indeed. It was, I was uh, as if I was taken, uh, almost like my father, to go help. You know, I was very proud. Can you imagine? That's exactly the thinking that I had when I was going into session. I'm going into session. He asked me, a man that he... He could do that on his own self. Why is he asking for me? Okay, that means he really has faith in me. I'm going to show him that I'm worth it. And that's exactly what I did. Now, now let me ask you. Go ahead, Janice. Go ahead, Janice. And I have a question, too. Get it in my life. Now, when you audited him and you said, this is the session, did he then behave as a PC? Ask. Or did he try and tell the you GQ. what to audit him on? <laughs> Absolutely. I told him this is the session and we are going to fly the routes first. And, you know, he understand what the, uh, this little language, you know. And I started, you know, I, I uh, the only time I had a little problem was just to go to 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 go beyond the PTP one. And. He Present was, time problem. Yeah, he, 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 his mind was on the ship and the parts that didn't come and blah, 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 blah. But then finally, but just by, you know, doing what I had to do, he finally realized, okay, he will take whatever he'll take and he'll go on. And he was, okay, we go. <laughs> okay. No, so he wasn't I, sitting there critiquing what you were doing. He was actually being, receiving the counseling from that point of view, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. 
they, you know, he felt. That's very interesting. He felt he he felt that he was in a good space, and he came out happy. <laughs> he hugged me on the way out. <laughs> no, I remember. I remember watching him coming down the hall with you, just laughing a jolly laugh, and you're with him, laughing with him. Yeah. And, and you were making sure that he was okay because he were about to pounce on me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to have to deal with him if he was upset from a session. You were, you were the strongest bulldog of the whole crew. I mean, all of them were pieces compared to you, you know. <laughs> Maybe once in a while, but you, wow. <laughs> wow. Janice, I think this is a we're, we're, we're gonna, this is a good point to end here, okay. and we're gonna have we're gonna have Bell back because we I have a lot more questions, and I'm sure he's got a lot more stories to tell us. He, he has <laughs> plenty more stories. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask him about Quentin Hubbard and and his Hubbard children and and you know the rest of his life and and all that. Uh, Bell, is that if it's all right with you, we'll have you come back. Is that all right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and I have to tell the story of when Balcassine saved myself, Jeanette, and Annie when we were in Casablanca. Oh, well, there you go. There's a teaser for our viewers. That'll be coming up. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you, Bell, for this first first interview. We're going to do some more with you as well. But uh, and, and we really appreciate you being here. In the meantime, I just wanted to tell our viewers, uh, please subscribe to our channel. Just hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. And then, as I mentioned before, if you've got any questions, just ask in the comment section, and we'll ask Bell about them. If you've got questions or things that you'd like to hear about, just get down in that comment section, and uh, we would really appreciate it. And then also, if you want to support our channel, you can buy us a coffee. It's a way to donate to the channel. You go down into the description. There's a link there. You click on it, and you can support us there. Um, you know, we really appreciate any support that we get from our viewers. The, the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is Janice has written two books about her time working for Hubbard uh, in the Sea Organization, Commodore's Messenger Book One, A Child Adrift in the Scientology Sea Organization. And then the other, the second volume is Book Two, of course, and it's uh, Riding Out the Storm with L. Ron Hubbard. And those are pictures of Janice with L. Ron Hubbard when she was one of his messengers. And both of these books are available at our merchandise store. You just go down to the store button, click on it. You can get autographed copies from Janice. She'll personalize the autograph and then she'll ship them to you in the United States. Um, you know, you pay for the shipping and all that, but they're available there and you'll get more details of a lot of these stories about being on the flagship Apollo with Hubbard. And then also you'll see there's photographs and diagrams and things like that. So if you're interested, please buy the book and I think you'll enjoy it. Janice, have you got something else you want to say? No, Bell, I'm loving this. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. it's great. Good to have you here. I want to tell your viewers to please, 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 do yourself a great favor and buy those books and read them. You will never see two better movies. I mean, multiple movies in those books that are absolutely phenomenal. Believe me, it's very well worth your reading and your money. Believe me. Thank well, that's you. wonderful. Yeah. And, and so just go down there, click on the store. You can order them right there, get autographed copies. I That's all I have for today. We're going to schedule you, Bell, and we'll do some more. I've got a lot of questions, and Janice does too. But in the meantime, until next time, everybody, we just want to say thank you to Bell. Thank you, Janice. And we'll thank see you next time. Okay? Thank you. Bye. Indeed, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.